Um, let, let's go ahead and get started so we give uh, Marco as much time as, uh, as we can. Um, so please join me in welcoming, welcoming back Marco, who I don't know, when, when was the last time you were in Bloomington, actually? Four years ago. Four, was it for a while? Yeah. Okay. So Marco's a, um, very much a friend and we can maybe say product of the workshop. Um, he was here for was about two years, is that right? Three and a half. Three and a half? Okay. Um, worked very closely with Lynn um, on a variety of things, but um, early before that, he had his formal training from uh, University of Maastricht, uh, I believe, in economics or some mathematics. flavor of economics and mathematics combined. Or no, you did a, you revolted my from my PhD economics. Is, my PhD is in mathematics. Um, but Marco's done a lot of work on natural resource governance, both from a theoretical perspective, conceptual perspective, experimental perspective, and simulation modeling perspective. Um, you, I can't even keep up with your publications. You're one of the few people who was as prolific as Lynn was, uh, I would say. Um, but very broadly um, published and then very closely allied uh, with the Resilience Alliance. And if you're familiar with the Resilience Alliance, um, you know about the work that, and maybe success of the Resilience Alliance had actually taken a concept that um, made, got some traction in a lot of communities beyond other kinds of social ecological system concepts, which maybe didn't. Um, so I, I won't belabor your CV because it's uh, long enough that it would take up the entire time here. Um, but the paper that you got um, for us discussion today is Playing Games to Save Water, Collective Action Games for Groundwater Management um, in, in Dwar Pradesh. And um, did Allison talk to you about the, the format? And the... I have five minutes. OK, yeah. So <laughs> it's not, we don't police it very strictly. So take what time you would like. Um, but yeah, the majority of the time is for questions and answers. And so do what setup you would like. And um, thanks for separating from uh, Arizona uh, in December. You arrived just before. Uh, it was uh, time to, to leave Bloomington because uh, the 34 degree temperature on Wednesday is uh, something that you might not have been able to survive. No. So, um, all right. So thank you, Marco. Please take it away. Okay. Well, it's great to, to be back. Um, so the, the paper I talk uh, uh, let us provide you is uh, uh, provide, uh, provide a little bit of background. Um, when a number of people like Juan Camilo Carinos and other colleagues do field experiments, they noticed um, that when they came back for a return visit that people sometimes um, had changed uh, some of their governance. So these are uh, field experiments that were done, largely done in Colombia. And uh, so about 15 years ago, Juan Camilo had kind of uh, one of uh, possible hypothesis people will learn from these experiments, which in one hand could be a concern for the IRB that you leave a footprint <laughs> uh, if you do these experiments. Um, so for a long time we uh, have been trying to find uh, a way to, uh, to test this. Can we, can we actually test whether you can uh, uh, do experiments and that there will be an impact on because that, if that's the case, you could use experiments as a, as a policy tool. Well, if we want to do this, you need to do these uh, experiments uh, at a very large scale. So that's very difficult and very expensive uh, to do. So uh, we were fortunate enough five years ago to, uh, uh, to get, um, uh, collaborate with the International Food Policy Research Institute um, Ruth Mines and Dick, who uh, some of you may know, she is there and she uh, uh, has been working with uh, Juan Camilo and me in the past and she got funding to do some pilot studies. Uh, Juan Camilo is leading some pilot studies in uh, Colombia uh, on irrigation and I work with people in India, with the NGO in India, uh, Foundation for Ecological Security to do, um, uh, do this in, uh, in India. So how this goes in the NGO world is that you get a call, a road call, so I, we got the project, uh, can you go next month to India? <laughs> um, well, I could not because you have to teach us as, uh, as a faculty, but I have a student who I 
uh, was well trained to, to uh, in experiments to, to go there. Uh, and I had to create a new design uh, for a groundwater uh, game, uh, a game that we had not uh, had done before, but without, so I provide the context here that without having been there, we created a, an experiment based on some other experiments that we done. We got some feedback of the NGO, but not that much, and, um, and we did these experiments that went very rapidly. And uh, uh, the experiment, so we trained people of the NGO to run these experiments because these experiments were done in the, uh, in the local language. The NGO works with more than uh, 10,000 communities all over India. And we did uh, the pilot studies with 30 communities where they were part of a special program where they were me uh, measuring groundwater. And we thought that would be a good idea because we could see the, the impact. So when we did the return visits a year later, the, the groundwater measurement program was stopped. Um, uh, so we could, there was not that data that we uh, anticipated was available, but we could do some, uh, we ran the experiments again and we got some more data on uh, mental models. Something that we had not anticipated, we thought it was uh, that there was a misunderstanding of, among the farmers about groundwater products. Um, as academics, we didn't realize that groundwater problem is relatively new for them, um, that they have powerful pumps and free electricity to, uh, to pump this water and now have major water shortage. Their mental model of the groundwater levels was related to rainfall. If the, the, the ground level is related to rainfall, not to the kind of crops you are planting. Um, so when they realized, though they had brought in, in the past, the NGO brought in engineers to talk about water budgets and that they had to calculate the water budgets, that didn't really help anything. And during these, when we did these games, uh, my students said, well, people stop pointing to the people NGO for uh, you always came with uh, this uh, talk about all these water budget things. We never understood what this was about. But now, now when we play this game, now I understand what this is about. So we realized that uh, the mental models is an important part. So when now, ideally, we we would have measured the mental models before we did the experiment, but we didn't know whether that was a, a key issue. So. So the results of this on this paper, as I said, is from a pilot study. The NGO is using now this method in and other places. We also have uh, they are doing now experiments on forest in 60 villages for a new project. Um, to the director of the NGO, I said we have not proven that this is uh, beneficial uh, scientifically. So he said, so what should I do now? Uh, but uh, we, uh, we noticed that people now talk about these issues, and in the past it was something very difficult to, uh, to talk about, about the groundwater problems and have a different kind of governance. Uh, so, so that's one of the challenges that the NGO see that it has, um, uh, 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 that it works, but scientifically we would like to do much more and a better management, uh, measurement. Uh, so we are trying to, set something up uh, uh, that we train them to collect better data. So that's, uh, that's not the focus of the NGO, to collect data. Uh, they, but we hope to get um, uh, with support of ASU some uh, ways that we can um, uh, get some better ways of collecting data so that we can have better understanding what may work and what's, what's not. So the games over time have been adjusting. So there is a, a website, Games for Sustainability, which includes also some uh, videos, including one in, I think it's in Hindi, uh, for those who are uh, more familiar. It's also translated in, in, in English. But all the steps that you have to do to do, run these experiments, because other NGOs uh, now also would like to adopt it. So it's getting its own life. Uh, there, have, there are many people using uh, games in, uh, in NGOs, but they typically are games that are developed together with the community. This is a very much based on some 
on, on based on theory, and it's uh, not context specific in that way. So for an NGO who works with thousands of communities, it's very cost effective that they could spend one day and use the same protocol and, uh, and engage with the community. And so the paper presents uh, some of the uh, findings of the uh, of the pilot study where we show that there seems to be an impact of the experiments that uh, uh, in the understanding of the, uh, of the governance that, that also these communities have changed some of their uh, practices uh, when they have played uh, these games. So I will leave it at this and we'll look forward to your questions. Mike. Yeah, I'm happy to start off with, Mark. It's great to see you back here again. But, but I was thinking along some of the same lines of what you just, you just talked about, about how you are communicating here but across two very different cultures. Uh, you're very interested in doing scientific research and getting this, using these games to, to get a better understanding of theories, theoretical understandings of collective action. And, this. and the NGO is very interested in helping the communities and not so much interested in science. Uh, and um, which is fine, but I wonder how you were able to navigate that, that divide and, and whether you're finding that, I mean, let me step back a little bit, because I know, I know that when Lynn and Jimmy and the others started with the, the CPR experiments, it really was all about figuring out how to understand the logic of collective action. Um, and when, it, when this work was extended to other communities and the field experiments, at least the talk around here was more in terms of, you know, we need to get beyond the Western European graduate students or you know, Western American students and to see if this, this same theory works in other cultures now. So it's a research question, still another research question. But not so much in terms of, hey, this is the way we can change people's lives. Mm -hmm. In, in less developed That's countries. what you actually argue if you want to get IRB approval that there will be no impact on the community. Well, no, that's a good point. Now, there's, there's an example of how you have to sort of navigate yeah. this because you're, you're, you're now realizing that you are changing the way people yeah. think about their own lives. And how does that complicate, you know, your next research proposal? Uh, uh, because you're actually doing now community action as well as research. So how are you balancing this? And, and did it help? What, one thing I... Couldn't, couldn't help noticing here. Ruth Mines and Dix and worked with Lynn for years. I mean, they knew each other very well. I think Brian Bruns is one of the people you yeah. cite here. I think it's involved. Well, in yes, also being part of the uh, implementation. Yeah, so these are people who are very familiar with the way these experiments were done around here at the, in the workshop. Uh, did that help make the communication to connect between these two cultures? Because you had practitioners and researchers who had seen much of the same thing and who had visited and said, and, and that would make it easier for you guys to do it than in other places. So just give me some reaction. Okay, so there are a number of um, uh, elements. So the first time we did, well, what we did in the, in the pilot study, we want to see also how people were playing the game. Now we are not interested in that anymore. But in the pilot study, we, we did. Right. Uh, actually, one issue was uh, payment. Yeah, I mean, we... we, we Thinking about the economies, we always use payments and, uh, uh, because that's that's uh, what you should provide a real incentive. The NGO is not really happy with individual payments. We just said, well, we need to do that, otherwise we cannot get published. So, so what the agreement then was to um, um, that half of the communities. So we did 20 communities uh, where we did experiments, 10 where we did individual payments, and 10 where we did payments to the community fund. So that was okay, the NGL said, "Okay, let's 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 do it. We test it." There was no effect of the way uh, this uh, we had paid. So if there was a flat fee to the community fund, there was no financial incentive uh, for the individuals to make the, the, these decisions. So, but there was no impact on the, the decisions they made. So that was uh, and uh, somebody else. Uh, Germany did recently experiments also in, uh, in the same context in India, and he found the same. Um, so, so the payment is an is an, an important element. Now we are not that interested for because we are interested in the impact 
and not uh, interested in what's happening during the experiment, mm -hmm. which may, uh, in terms of data collection, may be an, uh, an important element because, um, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, they are, um, the, the NGO may have different um, standard of data keeping than, uh, than, than, than we do. Um, so, of, yes, it certainly helped that Ruth uh, uh, was leading the, in a way, the project. So this mm -hmm. was paid via the IFPRI, and uh, and the NGO is also familiar with very familiar with Lynn's work. Uh, actually, Lynn brought uh, uh, me and the NGO together. Uh, actually, yeah. So they, because they they were building a lot on Lynn's work, so they it's it's not that they are not interested in the scientific part. Actually, they are doing a lot of GIS work and they bring uh, GIS maps to the villages. So they do they, they are they are uh, uh, engaged with science, but. Uh, their focus is to uh, to help these uh, communities, uh, but um, but there is a persistent problem. We try to get funding from NSF. You have this uh, uh, coupled human natural systems uh, uh, project, uh, about two million dollars. We got very good reviews, but no money. Uh, so try that three times. So. Uh, um, because then you have to package it as it's about research and, and not fo really focusing on the on the uh, actually that you impact so many people. It's it's more focusing on the research. So you have to package it in a way that. But basically, I would like to see this as a as a tool. So um, I now have uh, uh, submitted a proposal business plan to the president of our university. So I'm. I'm uh, did that last Friday, so I <coughs> different re review criteria than NSF. Different review criteria. <laughs> I think there's a major opportunity for ASU. <laughs> um, um, but it, uh, 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 I think there, uh, there is uh, one of the big challenges uh, uh, being in a school sustainability. That uh, and this is not only at ASU. That's what you will hear also in Washington D.C. People don't want to hear case studies anymore. You want to know how things scale up, and uh, and this NGO that wants to create, they want to scale up and go to 74,000 <coughs> communities in 2023. And we discussed, I uh, discussed with Jagdish when we were in Utrecht the same conference, and and so we can help them with uh, methods. But we have to find a mechanism, and so, so that's why I go to the university, uh, the university, to say we need to get some funds because this requires kind of a program manager who is uh, dealing with this. Because now I give pro bono advice to the NGO, and it's for me it's great to to be engaged with this, but it's you don't really know what is happening there. And uh, so people see this, say, well, gee, yes, all this, they may, the NGO can collect all this data. Yeah, but they are not collecting this data. They have other priorities. And if you don't uh, uh, train them, it's not only that you pay them, but also train them in uh, doing uh, uh, good data collection, then you don't get uh, the, the, the data that is needed to do some uh, serious work. And, and we have to provide also so they use nowadays also iPads for showing the JS uh, information. So you can develop some tools that they directly collect data, and that the data will be centrally stored and not lost, as that's actually one of the villages. The data was never recovered uh, because they moved to another office, and all this paperwork just disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are things I've, I've I, I've been there and uh, uh, seen a lot of the, how they operate. It's all uh, on the last minute uh, arrangement when they are driving to these, these villages. So it's, it's, it's a very different way of working and we would like to plan things a long time in advance. And you have to basically you have to have some intermediate person who is dealing with this if we want to study uh, how 
we can improve those practices. Yeah. But who's funding that? That's not the NSF, so that's why you have to find other mechanisms. Yeah, thank you. It's along the same uh, lines of the, <coughs> sort of like an intersect between theory and practice. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me that like, what you are thinking in terms of like social learning, uh, the outcomes of social learning in particular, are uh, perhaps in this paper um, related to technical knowledge to some extent, what might be termed technical knowledge. It's about the degree to which the community understand um, understands the, the, the way in which groundwater management is, how withdrawal impacts groundwater resources. Uh, but the game has obvious implications for the sort of like interpersonal social learning in a context of scarce resources. Uh, the mental model questionnaire, uh, I haven't looked very uh, closely at the appendix and I want to hear more about that, uh, but it seems to me that the mental mo model um, questionnaire is not really targeted to understanding the sort of like a more social social learning than the technical social social learning and I wonder if this is in terms of like having impact on the communities having impact on perhaps funding for the project or even like interesting result is this something that you are thinking about is it something that you are like hoping to get at at some point because that seems to me something that can really bridge the sort of like a theory and practice divide uh, in ways that might be of use to the NGOs as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if you sort of like uh, identify channels of uh, enhanced cooperation, that might be something that the NGOs are uh, really interested in. Yeah. So, um, yeah, these are all questions that we are really <laughs> focusing on. Um, so, one uh, aspect that I may not have um, uh, mentioned, because games are used a lot also in education, but we are not teaching people. Experiment. Although in India people like to, to teach, uh, and also the NGOs like to teach, so we have to teach them not to teach when mm -hmm. they do these experiments. So, which makes it uh, a challenge about what do we measure in terms of uh, impact. So, if we want to stimulate uh, self governance, and so we provide kind of this, uh, an action arena which they could explore. The, the, the problem, but we don't impose any solution. Um, so they may learn things that are, we may not anticipate with what's happened, but they may also learn about um, uh, we should, uh, uh, if we share this uh, water, uh, groundwater with some other villages, we should uh, make use of it now, otherwise uh, we may not benefit from the groundwater which is available. So. There could be all kind of potential implications. Um, actually, we are uh, writing now an article about the, the, the learning because one of the challenges is that a lot of the social learning uh, research of elementary mental models is extremely time consuming. And, and, and that becomes very limited of use if you want to really go to a larger scale. And uh, you cannot uh, go, uh, so uh, one approach is that you have kind of a process which is more open-ended and you get all kind of information from the different uh, uh, people in the community and then you have a more structured uh, survey and um, and you cannot expect your people spend uh, their days in giving you information. So that becomes a, a challenge. So we are now um, kind of exploring what are the, 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 the methods that are available that we can um, collect data um, that might be more useful uh, in this context, where also here the, the, uh, the data collection is done by the NGO. And one benefit we will have is that the NGO is interacting with this, with this community on a regular basis. So often there is not really a baseline in a lot of these mental model studies. And so that's something that uh, uh, we could uh, get. So if there will be a kind of a yearly uh, survey that it's not only our use of games, but all kind of other types of interventions, the other things that may have happened that we could see the changes over time in a number of metrics. 
we have looked into uh, we have a simplified version of the CPR uh, uh, data based the questions that we were in and we were actually that's what we uh, we collected data in 50 villages uh, my a student of mine who actually is originally from Andhra Pradesh uh, developed this and then trained the NGO he collected data himself in eight villages, and then we got the data from 42 other villages, and it was clear that they looked on the, the rules on paper, the information on paper. They didn't verify it, what was actually happening in the village, because when the special said, that cannot be true, that cannot be true. So, so here we saw the, uh, that um, that has to be felt, creating a survey that can be uh, implemented based on the best knowledge we, we have, uh, but also training these people to be really critical in collecting the data. And, and so we cannot expect that uh, we always send uh, uh, PhDs to the field to, to do this, but we can train also still, we, we can do train people of, of the NGO so that they will be collecting data that might be more uh, yeah, useful in terms of the informal arrangements that are, are happening there. So what often happens in these villages, there is money to create that there's the NGO is involved and they, they get money for some uh, projects of um, they, so one type of money they get is that there is funding from the federal government to kind of employ people for some, some amount of uh, hours a week to uh, build infrastructure and that's often used for restoration that the NGO help it to use for restoration and when the project is and then they create all kind of arrangements uh, governance arrangements and they use actually the design principles to create some of these arrangements mm -hmm. And then the money is up, and then those arrangements don't continue. So that's, that's uh, but if you only look at the rules on paper, then that's not sufficient. So we, so we have been looking into this, but we, uh, we need to do, so that's why we need to have a better uh, kind of workflow between the, the, the scientist and the NGO in order to do this. That seems to be a key bottleneck. Yeah. Bernie. So, so Mark, I'm, you know, I'm more applied than you are. And I work with the urban more green... More applied than a mathematician. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Fly> mathematician. <laughs> yeah. so I work with urban greening nonprofits, plant trees in cities. And we've looked at uh, a suite of those nonprofits over a designated period of time and how they plant trees and work with the neighborhoods they work in to you know, get trees planted, care for it, whatever. And you're right in that they, they're not interested in collecting any data. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got to collect the data. But what we find is when we go back with results, they've already evolved to another step. <clears throat> and so you, you might be reporting on what they were doing, they're not really doing that anymore, and, and but they're interested in asking us questions how they can do things better and whatever. But you have to then you have to then switch on to now what are they doing today, you know? And they're continually moving down the road, and and so that's what kind of intrigues me as a researcher. You're looking at it as a researcher, and I'm looking at it more as you know, as, as an applications guy, and it, it's a real struggle. Because you sit down with them and you say, all right, they, you know, they say, we'd really like some advice on how to do this. And when you start talking, you realize we're not working on the same level that you were before. You've gone to a different level. Uh, yeah. Because they have full-time employees and they're engaged. Now, if you work with a nonprofit uh, that has no, you know, all volunteers, <laughs> they haven't moved as fast. And you're, you're a little better off. But we work with some nonprofits that have 25 or 30 full-time employees. And the NGO has all a full time staff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if, if you interact with, with uh, I think there are now 14,000 villages that they are working with. Okay. So, um, 
and they are well funded uh, in India in a way that's the, the their operation um, and a lot of them have uh, master degrees and uh, actually some of them is uh, uh, also go later for a PhD there's one uh, one of the others is now in a PhD program um, and um, so the, I, the NGO in that way, so my, I see my role as helping the NGO doing better, mm -hmm. uh, a better job. Um, but we also would like to collect data that we can not, so they typically take pictures because their focus was on restoration. So you have pictures with a very degradated land and then you have a picture with a little bit more <laughs> Green and then mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, a lot of trees at the, the third picture and that's what they then go to to their donors mm -hmm. and they say, see this is the impact of our work. Um, but we would like to collect some other type of data and um, and that's and that and a lot of them actually have social workers there at their training. Um, so but this, but then they are there's still a the gap in. Mm -hmm what kind of tools are now what we can use. So we have been discussing also with IFPRI because IFPRI is really the key player here because they it's also now they have this project on forest and uh, ecosystem services. So then I'm at a conference and then I'm dragged in this project again and developing an, an experiment. These things can really ad hoc. For me it's kind of what is the this this has to be the, uh, created. Uh, we have to work on this for months. They say no, no. Next week they get trained, so we need to develop this now. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so uh, so it's uh, they 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 know what is happening in the in the field in a way. That's uh, they have offices at different places in in India. So so I and if and if. The things are changing in the field. That's not my responsibility, no. So, but they may move on to other projects as the NGO. So my, I see my interaction is with the with the NGO. So your sample size is really one, the NGO. Well, we can go to multiple NGOs, but I'm helping yeah. the NGO okay. to, to. Uh, so I I don't. Uh, so that's so the. That, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with one NGO, mainly. Uh, so, but, and they interact with uh, uh, 14,000 villages. Um, I would not be, it would be out of my uh, scope to know everything that is happening on the ground. Uh, I will also feel not be, um, I think that's, that's, but there are now, we are thinking about other ways of collecting data. So people have mobile phones. There are um, also, um, uh, at ASU, the is, uh, faculty was working on uh, uh, solar powered uh, hotspots. And so, uh, so the, yeah, that's part of the business plan that we <laughs> submitted. So you can create, uh, you can provide a lot of uh, educational tools to these villages. Um, and maybe also get them engaged, uh, do some citizen science in rural areas in India. So that that is a is a possibility to get them more engaged, and that's also what the NGO would like to to uh, uh, be is also interested in. And they also have a program where they have village leaders teaching other village leaders. So they have also uh, invest in education among the different communities. But yeah, these are, uh, yeah, that, that I, it's a good concern if I was directly involved with, if I would be in the US, and that's what we may talk about, uh, with, about the lake associations, that will be one of my concerns, that those things will change when we are, actually, you have to have people who know really what's happening with these practitioners. So it's our corner here. Yes, and it's a progression down the, the road. Um, you okay. say progression or regression? <laughs> <Same pro. laughs> um, so just think, I'll, next week at this time, I'll be in Bogota working on 
community. So mm -hmm. I hope that's kind of interesting. Yeah. What we'll be teaching together. Um, but what I'm thinking about when you go back to NSF for the what's the broader significance or when you go back to your president of why you want even more money. Um, I never I, got money for this from NSF. You, oh, good. Okay. But, but when you go to the, they'll always want to know, you know yeah. how, what are the other implications outside mm -hmm. of what you're doing. And the way I read this, I, I found it really fascinating that the process itself, playing these games, has this uh, learning impact on the players. And I've been thinking, um, and I've changed my view a lot on this in the last 10 years, about the, the process of building a constitution for a country. And I used to just think of it as an output. You get the constitution, you put it in place, it has these impacts. And even though most constitutions are never really applied, uh, but because they're just not, for the most of the world, you know, they're ignored. Um, but the process, people are arguing, of people getting together, of hammering out these things, has an incredible impact on social capital for a lot of these countries. And there's no one's systematically developed any data to test this, but there's enough people out there now who, and I, I certainly would argue that was the case in the Brazilian Constitution 1988, that through that process, the belief structure in that society changed significantly, even though it was a terrible constitution. Um, but the participatory aspect of it social capital aspect of it not didn't simply codify beliefs but it helped develop and shape the beliefs of that society and I think you're really you're saying a, a similar thing here I think uh, which I found really fascinating you've got it much more at the uh, micro level and you will be able to measure this and you've got you know games of how you can do this um, but I was thinking about this in other spheres. So I think it has it, this, this thinking about the process rather than the outcome as being inherently uh, important for changing outcomes in a relatively unanticipated way is, um, I'm still kind of struggling with it of how I can take this to other areas like law um, and, and think about it. And then the next meta game is when enough people know about the process, how it changes them, then can the process still change them uh, because they've already gone through the process in a way that they've known enough of these experiments. Um, so maybe there's this, that's kind of the meta mm -hmm. game. But, but in the meantime, these processes think I, I found it really fascinating um, I mean in, am I just out there in left field or do you think no I, I think we ex, 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 uh, uh, got to do a similar uh, mm -hmm. a transition over the last well I believe it was about 15 years ago when I came here I was really focused on the rules yeah, I wanted right, to yeah. make models about how rules will change over time exactly and actually that was the, the first uh, uh, SF grant was about the dynamics of rules. That was the title of the, the experiment. It was also with Juan Camilo and, and Lynn and, and others. And then actually during that experiment, which was including field experiments in Colombia and in Thailand, we realized, we realized that it's not about the rules. Yeah. Uh, because people were, especially in Colombia, they were breaking the rules a lot, <laughs> even if they had voted for them that, uh, on it. Um, it was uh, much more on the process. Yeah. Um, so we gave them options and then they could choose one of the three options and well later we realized well these people from Bogota they come uh, to us these bad people from Bogota they come to the rural area and they, they have to choose one of the three options none of them is for us interesting so they were breaking these these rules and for uh, later we reflect yeah that's obvious in a way we provide them something that they didn't care about it 
and uh, they, even that they could uh, voted for for one was not their role. And uh, and with Dan DeCaro, uh, we did uh, we published a paper uh, two years ago on experiments that were done here, on uh, where. He measured how people were perceiving the process uh, during the experiment, <coughs> and uh, we found that uh, on, uh, you, we, we looked at whether you had uh, voting or imposed rules, and whether you had sanctioning or no sanctioning. Only when you had voting and sanctioning, you had uh, a positive uh, change, <coughs> and a change persisted. Um, if you had only voting and no Enforcement people who didn't got what they voted for, they were just not obeying the, what was elected. Uh, what was uh, and if, if there was a rule, uh, was rules were imposed, and we used the same distribution of rules imposed as the rules that were elected. But we didn't, uh, if the rules were imposed, people didn't, they didn't found that a fair process and they didn't uh, uh, follow those uh, uh, rules. So we continue now doing this with communication experiments, uh, trying to understand during the experiment how people perceive this. Of course, it's all small scale. So mm -hmm. it's, um, um, but yeah, that's 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 a bias looking into people. If you look at larger scale, I don't know how that will translate. Um, but um, but I know from. Uh, and this is not new that people use games, uh, role games, and all, all these tools have been used uh, a lot. And I also know from colleagues who do a lot of these role games that they they ask permission from a higher authority to play games in communities. And sometimes say, yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's nice too, but you are not allowed to do this because you empower those people. We don't like it. Well, we don't say it ex exactly like that. but. Basically, they say we don't want uh, the, the, that you empower these communities. Um, so, um, but but yeah, I think uh, uh, at least at the at the community level, these these uh, can be very powerful, and that is also used. That's why there's so many games also used in uh, in education. It's a, it's a good learning uh, tool. Um, um, but how this play out to to constitutions, I yeah, uh, that's another level. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of talk about the participatory society, especially if, in the, in the, and I was now all talk about the participatory society. Uh, but what that exactly is is uh, I don't know what that. It's not uh, uh, some. Uh, well, I don't know how that will go in a, in a. Uh, and the larger scale, how that will really plays out. Just on a related point, just because it's cooked, Please. it just occurred to me as I was listening to your discussions and the way you're, you're, you're describing it, when you're talking about looking at the process of the creating the Constitution as opposed to just the, the rules itself, it seems to me there's a bridge from that to what some of the legal scholars, legal <coughs> and social science scholars, related to the rule of law that the rule of law is deemed more an emergent property. Mm -hmm. It's not the result of the rules itself. Correct. Yeah, and so it just seems like, but that's a way of yeah. bridging a lot of work that was already done with those. So it just, it's I think just, it's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. So um, it just seems like bridging that way of looking at it or framing it would be a nice complement to what you're talking about. Because even how, when they try and develop indices of rule of law and what does it mean, Again, it's, it's the combination of the circumstances of which the the way in which you develop the rules in itself contributes to. Um, so we just on it. It's the process. So, so that's yes. why constitutions being imported have failed miserably, because it's a large part. It's the process yes. that's highly important. Um, but even in situations where the output is not going to be enforced. It nevertheless has some downstream payoffs um, to those uh, societies. I mean, no one's really measured it, so these are all anecdotal case studies that people have talked about. But, um, you know. Yes? Um, I know this was super fascinating. Um, but, and so my question is definitely at a sort of lower level, 
we've been discussing sort of smaller questions, but curious anyway. So I'm going to ask it. Um, I was curious about two things. One is whether you had any information or understanding as to whether any of the what you're calling habitats had actually experienced before the games and in the past actual um, complete depletion or groundwater. Um, and if so, whether there was a way of understanding how that experience maybe shaped how they understood or experienced the games. Um, I obviously can't go back and measure what you did, I'm just curious. Because um, I, I, would, I would expect people to maybe take the games potentially more seriously or to see this slightly differently if they'd actually gone through groundwater depletion experience um, over a particular season or um, or real life round, as it were. The other question I had um, had to do with the fact that you find this result that like even in the control groups there are occasional changes and they all seem to be sort of in the direction of like adopting rules. And I was wondering whether you had any reflections on that. So, you know, we, um, I think one of my favorite uh, cartoons is this sort of uh, We've done, we've been really, really successful for 99%, let's change the strategy to the last 1%, right? So we can get that last 1%. So that's not really what's going on here. You really only have one change, like without the games, but I was just curious yeah. as to whether there's any um, sort of, what else might be going on, or if that's just, yeah. I mean, one in four is not, yeah. could be an error, could not be right. So the first question, of, uh, they typically have a number of wells in a community and um, so from, so I, I was not there when they did, the experiment but this from the student pool uh, was there that the, uh, some communities, most of the wells were dried up. So actually there was one community where they had a lot of tomatoes, they had a school, uh, so they improved uh, a lot of their, their uh, local community, but the wells, a lot of the wells were now dry. So um, they uh, so they uh, experienced short, actually uh, all over India, they experienced major shortness of water. And um, as the director of the NGO talks, the area where we did our research, they sell, uh, some people sell their limbs to survive. So this is kind of the poverty uh, that people experience. And um, so the, the fact that there are changes uh, still happening at ad adoptions is that the NGO is working with these communities. So it's, this was an extra element to that. So um, it's not um, that, uh, so they were work, they are working all, uh, with them on a different number of different issues, but water is a key element in, in Andhra Pradesh. So uh, because of the, it's also the geology that makes it that um, uh, the groundwater is a, is a big issue there, um, but um, if you look at the map of, uh, of, of India where there is the groundwater problems, this is an area where one of the most severe water uh, scarcity problems, so a lot of the NGOs work is, they fo typically focus on restoration issues, uh, so drip uh, irrigation is um, something that actually exists uh, in a lot in, in India, but typically with bigger farmers, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's much more difficult to get it implemented at the village level because they have to uh, collaborate to, to do that, to, to uh, big infrastructure investment. Um, but uh, some communities now start doing this. And, uh, and that is, I, we don't, we, oh, I don't think we can just say because of these games or it's, those are things that they they provide options to these communities. It's not that they know that imposing solutions is not working to these communities, and they, these communities have to invest in it themselves. It's not that they get this for free, so uh, they have to see the benefit uh, of it. But the NGO can provide options and how to resolve some of these problems. Jimmy. Marco, I'm still um, hung up on a couple of things. I'm still trying to understand, are these actual experiments? Are they more like classroom exercises? And is it 
absence of classroom exercises? Are they, is the idea that you're, you're changing their understanding of the problem and that plays out in their decisions? I have a secondary question, which is, does your IRB really ask you, or do they make you say that your experiments will not change the behavior of your subjects? But let's come back to that. We yeah. have time. Because if they do, that's a silly question. <clears throat> uh, but so, so you said that the effect of payment has, not paying has no effect. So does it have no effect on decisions in the game, and first of all, the payments tied to decisions in the game, which I think you're saying they are, and if it's not having an effect, or, or does it, you say, it's not, is it not having an effect on what happens over the course of their understanding of the game or the process during the next year or something like that? Because, so think about it, so no economist would say only, only monetary incentives matter. Nobody mm -hmm. would say that. So the experiments in general are designed, because we know that, to create an anonymous, to create anonymity, create controls, try to have dominance where the payments themselves change, and we, in some sense, hope that those are important enough that they have they override other considerations. That's that's kind of the goal here. So I think before I would say payments have no effect. I would be asking myself that question. Are you changing the incentives in the game and saying, seeing how they respond to those changes? We've all played poker for matchsticks, poker for pennies, and pokers for dollars. We know we, we make different decisions. Except maybe Dean, I don't know. But uh, or these guys in the corner, I don't know. So, so we, no, we, we, we know these things can matter. There's a lot of money. But it's in that sense, if, if you're going to go forward with this, if this is partly a teaching tool and all those things, then it's important that they understand those things. Yeah. That, that, these, these, that people will change their decisions. You know, if, if one of these crops, this crop that uses more water, if all of a sudden it is much more valid, it's much more profitable to grow that crop, people are going to respond to that. And you don't want to teach them that people don't respond to that. So that's, in a way, my concern comes back to I, I don't know. I think we teach our classes. We are always cha shaping the. In some sense, we're always shaping the behavior of our students. So, yeah, you're off into this. You know, the Star Trek problem. You know that, and Star Trek issue, or whatever. So, that's my, I guess that's my comment or question. Okay. So, do like two minute answer. And two, <laughs> one one more question. So if you can keep this. Relatively. Yes. So we run it the same way as field experiments were run uh, in, in, in the past which is not ideal in terms of that it will be, people may figure out what people, so what I expect what is happening, if, if you go to these fields, everybody knows each other, they will never, if they, people will figure out who, who has been earning what. And so in that way, there's no anonymity. Uh, officially during the experiment there is, but, um, so we run the same way as, as Juan Camino and others have been running with field experiments. Um, if you really do it, so in that way it might be that he has been, if, if you do it really in terms of, uh, uh, they will go be in the cubicle and they make the decision, then, but that's not how these experiments are run in the field. So uh, now we are adjusting it more to a intervention tool. It becomes more like a classroom experiment. We try to have it more engaging in a way to uh, and have visual tools yeah. and so yes it becomes more that the the payment issue is really a concern, an issue for that the NGO does not like to have uh, individual payments for for good reasons because it may cause all kind of disruptions to the community and basically what our finding is it seems to be fine to provide a flat fee to the community. And people still take it seriously. Uh, they, um, the fact that they may not get individual payment may not affect how they change it. Uh, so on the IRB, I, it's, not, it's not a direct quote. Uh, 
and and for this project, it's the if pre will got the uh, uh, IFB, not uh, ASU. I'm happy about that. Um, but with ASU, I got difficulty in doing getting IRB for field experiments. Uh, at least the first time I did it, because they said, "Oh, you give people uh, pay people a different amount, uh, the same amount of time. You should give them, you should just give them this, all the same." I said, "No, no, it cannot do it." So mm -hmm. there was a lot of difficulty in getting approval for doing field experiments. Um, if we then say, well, actually, we would like to see what is happening with these experiments, our goal is to see what is the implication of the experiments. I, I, you may trigger some uh, kind of concerns that they otherwise not have. So uh, I'm happy that we did it all via IFPRI, where they are a little bit more understanding about uh, this kind of research. 30-second question, one and a half minute answer. This is, this is pretty related to what Jimmy was just asking. Um, it, I see that you, you, know, you really set up the decision as a trade-off between sort of water conservation and profit maximization. And I, I wonder, it, it just got me thinking like, you know, what is the actual message being communicated? And then when you think about all of these related issues such as in this example, crop A was millet. Most like farmers conceived of it as millet, and B was sugar cane. So it's mm -hmm. a staple crop and a cash crop, which is typically how you know, the low water efficiency and the high water efficiency crop go. And so I, you know, I was just concerned or wanted to hear what you thought about issues that are peripheral to this sort of core message and how, you know, if farm, if you think farmers, uh, you know, should be learning much more uh, information in addition to that message, do you know what I mean? Like, so sort it's, of something it's, about... Yeah. So when we, with, with every experiment, we have to simplify it to a particular uh, uh, core of, of framing in a way. So, but we are not teaching them, uh, they know much better than, than me about what their situation is. Uh, so, and these are kind of trade-offs they are making, that's also, the, uh, but of course there's so much more uh, involved in the decisions they are making. So we only focus here on crop choice A and, and, and B, and yes, there's, there's more to that, but, uh, and, and they are, they are not stupid, they, not, they really know what is happening, but it facilitates them to have a discussion about the implication on groundwater. I did it as a class experiment in uh, Beijing, and then I had the discussion on uh, sustainability, and the group who depleted uh, the water, he said, oh, we were the most sustainable. We can, we can now buy their water. Hmm. Oh, wow. so, <laughs> so it's really perception about what is the, what is the outcome. So we don't want to impose that. So that's why it's actually also fun to, to do this as a classroom experiment and talk well, what's the, now the meaning of what happened. Uh, if you do that with different groups, uh, you may get very different results. Uh, so it's actually very interesting to hear that response from the Chinese students. Uh, yeah. OK. Um, well, join me in thanking Marco for coming at a very busy time in the semester. Your call will be disconnected.